or how about this, I've made it to Dobinson's HQ in Rockhampton. This is going to be a very special day because I get to take you guys on a tour of the Dobinson's factory and how they make springs and shocks and how it all works. So let's go check it out. How are we going, lads? Ruben, how are you, mate? Good to see you again, mate. Nice to meet you, Adam. Nice to how meet are you? Oh, excellent, mate. Welcome to Rocky. Oh, mate, what a magnificent place. Good, mate. Uh, Weather is fantastic compared to Toowoomba. I'll tell you what, I've been freezing. I wore a jumper all the way up here. I got out of the car. I'm like, I'm starting to sweat. <laughs> uh, mate, we're good up here. We've got 25 degrees tomorrow, ready for the race. Big greens looking good. Ready to send it down the strip? Yeah, mate. I cannot wait. Don't know how many seconds it's going to do it. Probably have to send a postcard <laughs> yeah, yeah. to the other end, but we'll see how she goes. All good, mate. We're just having to head down the factory and take a look. Oh, mate, cannot wait. Okay, so this is pretty much our core manufacturing. So yep. everything we do is actually computerised, so we can sort of see how many cores we've got on order, production outputs for the day, customers, who's done what. Um, what, how many is at each stage, and then we can use that for quality assurance. So we run a paperless system, so developed it all in house. Um, literally, no paper down here. It goes from coils get sold, fully electronic, all the way through our entire production system. Tracks every person, what they've done, how long they've taken, the raw material that we use, the ingredients in that raw material, right back to the manufacturer at the steel mill, their uh, their heat numbers and their raw ingredients as well. So we've got full traceability from our batch number right back through the process. So. Well, that's unreal. Really good, mate. Mm, right away. Pretty cool stuff. So, so um, sorry. starts as, a, as a, a big coil of steel, as you can see inside the deep coiler here. So, um, carb winding, we've had this now for about two years. So, um, on the bigger stuff, there's only a few other carb winders in Australia, but they only do the small material up to about 10 mil. So, yep. we can't run anywhere from 10 mil up to 20 mil. So, um, yeah, so that's 20 mil now. We've got uh, 90 mil wire in there at the yep. moment. So, this is super high tensile, really high quality steel. So, it's already hardened and tempered. So, this steel now is at about 2000 MPA. Yep. So, to give you some context for tensile strength, a grade 8 bolt, you know, your high tensile bolt, yep. it's about 800, 880 MPA. So, yep. you're looking at two and a half times the tensile strength of this steel alone and a grade 8 bolt, so... And, and that, act, that machine actually coils that tensile. That tensile. So the power in this machine is incredible. So oh, yeah. this bar here, while it's in the decoiler, it's actually a straight bar. It's been bound up like a spring into a coil and strapped in. Um, so if this come out of here, it would be like a... You can imagine it would just go you know, two kilometres long. Like a, yeah, yeah, you can imagine. I wouldn't like to be standing around. I wouldn't if want to that be in there. It might be like birds nesting in an overhead fishing rod. So, <laughs> so the production capacity for this machine, uh, compared to your hot winding, is probably five or ten times. So, uh, incredible bit of gear, uh, huge investment, but uh, the amount of springs we're producing now and just the growth of the brand around the world, uh, we need this. So, this is what we need to keep the production up. Well, let's have a look at how it actually works. Coming a bit closer. So you can see here, we're just getting fed through the wire guide into the feed rollers here. And these are, it's essentially um, a bunch of axes, much like a CNC machine center. So all CNC driven, these are in and out at certain times. And we've got our pitching arm to control the pitch. That's going in and out as well. And then our cutting arm. Um, so the beauty of this is we can achieve really uh, highly stressed, lightweight springs. A lot of advantages with that as well. We can do all different sorts of shapes and particularly for the uh, we're doing a few customers now who are into the trophy trucks, the off-road racing industry. Yep. Um, and they're chasing the cold band coils for that, that quality, that tensile strength, um, and that, that constant reliability for performance and stuff. So what cold roll actually can cold give you. Cold roll can, can yeah. give you over the hot round. So the hot yeah. round, we can still get a really good spring with the hot round, but with the wire that we're able to use and the shape and the, the designs we can achieve with this, um, yeah. it's just on another level. So. You can see that the axe is moving in and out to give us the shape we're chasing there. Give us the coil we like. Just like that. That is unbelievable. <laughs> So 
satisfying watching it get it's, rolled out. <laughs> so Ben, what's this piece to do over here, mate, once it's uh, come out of there? Right, oh, so after we've done the kind of winding, uh, yep. we've induced a lot of stresses in the steel, so because it's already hardened and tempered, uh, we want to stress relieve the steel, so as soon as they're rolled, they're straight into the furnace here at about 390 degrees. Uh, yep. You can see the chain moving very slowly here, and that'll get us through the other end in about an hour at 390, and that's the stress relieving process. So. In comparison to the hot winding where we harden and then temper, we have that pre-heat treated, hardened and tempered bars, and then we stress relieve. So okay, yep. straight through and then it's ready for the next process. Oh, unreal. Right, so we're starting the cutting process. Um, so these ones have got to be peeled down, so um, tapered down bars, which we'll go and show you in a minute. But this is a very basic process. So if you come through here, just want to walk through there. Super simple, pull the buttons for a set of shears, throw them to the set length, we just set our cut length and um, away you go. So, so you've just set this as a stop. stop, these will come through here, it'll hit the stop, cut. bang, done. goes over here, yep. roll straight into there, yep. ready for the ready furnace. For the furnace. So some of them will go in, into um, bar peeling, so we come and have a look at these ones. Depending on uh, the, the finish we want, sometimes we have to taper the end of the bar down there. So. This might be, say, 24 mil, and we want you to take this down to 20 mil so it can sit in the seat of the car, so. Awesome. This is our hot winding machine. So this is the first uh, hot winding machine we got in the late 90s. Yep. Uh, this one does some pretty big stuff. So you can see here we're doing some armoured um, H1 Hummer rear coils. So wow. that's 28 mil wire. Okay. Incredible. That is absolutely unreal to watch. Yeah, that's more that's more cool to watch than the old roll machine. <laughs> so it's a bit, a bit more labour intensive, a bit slower, but um, we can do up to 35 mil on this machine. So you can see these big coils. He's just sitting over there doing a quality check now. So these coils are actually wound around the mandrel. So. So that goes in the furnace to normalise again. That's right, relief. so we're going back up to 850, so this is the hardening process. So the bars oh, yeah. we roll here now, they just come from uh, in their annealed form, so just, they're soft essentially. Yep. A little bit harder than mild steel, but kind of similar to mild steel. So what we're doing, heating them up to about 900, uh, we throw them on the winder, form them, then we reheat them back to 850 for the quenching, and then we'll drop them into the oil tank in a minute. So, uh, Unreal. Yeah, again, this machine, we got it. Yeah, 25 odd years ago, uh, it was a manual machine and then we converted it to CNC so that we can save the spring programs and change over quickly. So I was going to say, how would you do that manually? How would you Change that? the gears and press the button. So all the gear ratios in the back, you would change to change how fast that spins around and how fast it, it feeds the pitch out. So. so these here are cut to the exact length. That's right. So we get the bar, yep. raw material, cut them to length, roll them into the furnace there. Yep. And then form them. So production obviously is considerably slower, but we do have more run stuff on this than the stuff that we can't do on the, on the card winder and our, our other winder down there. So yep. with the, the mandrels we roll these around, we're able to achieve very strict tolerances on the inside diameters and, and the cut lengths and the number of coils and stuff. So for this one, once we've got all the tooling set up, as you can see here, it's just a matter of getting the, the right free height or roll height and um, away we go. Blows me away. So much, so much science and technology goes into that one piece of steel that is coiled around that everybody takes for granted. Exactly. So, and behind the scenes, and really understanding the heat treatment and, and those sides of things is what makes a good spring as well. So, if you don't get that heat treatment exactly right, that's when you're going to have dramas, all sorts of issues. So. How about that? Here in Rockhampton, Australia, you're making springs for the American military. That's it. How so, amazing is that? Incredible. So, and these will go all around the world. So these ones here, um, probably to the States or probably to the Middle East as well. So um, armoured vehicles for us, it's a, it's a pretty big market. So uh, Middle East, plenty of conflict. Government agencies, United Nations need armoured vehicles and like yourselves, they end up at five and six tonne. Yeah. They need some big springs. Yeah, absolutely. Right, so we're down here at uh, Winder 2, this is the second winder we got. Uh, we built this ourselves, fully custom, uh, and it does a wind and quench in one process. So you can see here, wind straight around the mandrel, it's considerably quicker than uh, Winder 1. We do a coil about every sort of 15 or 20 seconds. Yep. Uh, 
And what, go straight what up springs with these two? So we've got some C5506. So I'm going to say they're probably a Subaru WRX front. So wow. Best more than the, the big cruiser stuff, but um, still a market out there for it. So you can see here, he's just pulling the bar out again at about that 900 degrees. Yep. Straight around the, the uh, wind around the mandrel there. CNC controlled again. Straight onto the conveyor. The conveyor goes down to the oil bar, quenches straight it. Straight into the oil bar for hardening for quenching. So yep. that gives us the hardening process that we're, we're So chasing. what size rod is that? So these ones here, we're looking at 15 mil bar. 15 mil bar. We've got a 125 inside diameter, 141 conical shape. Yeah. Uh, five and a half coils, 393 line. So with the, the way this one works, we're able to control the, the free heights and the pitches of the springs much more accurately. So the repeatability of this process for the free heights is, is within one mil over a few hundred coils. So um, we'll do quality checks every 10 coils. And from there, it's, um, it's, it's always bang on. So. Absolutely amazing. Is that furnace electric? Electric furnace, so we've got all electric here. It just gives you the, the quality control for the heat much better than anything else can, so. Plus it'd be a bit more safer than gas. A lot safer than gas. Uh, electricity prices is the only drama, so we've got 2,000 solar panels on the roof to try and offset that, but uh, it's still nonetheless. It's So the coil's coming through the oil trough there that we wound earlier. Uh, now they're cooled down, they're fully hardened now. So the coils themselves are probably getting up as close as being as hard, hard as glass. So they're quite brittle in their state here. So a bit like we do with the stress we're leaving, we've got to now temper them. So when you hear tempered glass or, or hardening and tempering, we're hardened now to the oil trough and the quench process, and now we're going into tempering. So it'll so we'll go through another furnace. Another furnace here, similar yeah. to the stress we're leaving for around an hour or so, yeah. and that'll give us uh, keep some of the hardness, but it'll also give us the durability that we need for a spring. Wow. So what type of oil is that? It's a quenching oil, so it's a specific oil. It's not just any old oil. You can't quench in anything, but it will give you different um, hardnesses. So you can quench in water, but it'll make it harder and more brittle. Make it more brittle, yeah. So you can get different grades of the quenching That's oil. That's right, and that will give you different hardnesses. So the time it cools down from our quench temp, uh, and, and cools down a bit further, that, that time period is what gives you that hardness. So uh, the medium to slow is the one that we need to get the hardness that we're chasing. So specific quench, quench oil um, gives us exactly what we're chasing. All right, so once the coils are uh, either come through the uh, hardening and tempering process after winding, or through that stress relieving furnace, yep. we then move them onto the end grinders. So, oh, simple process. Straight on. And we're just Finishing the ends up there so that they seat properly on the car. So some cars have a flat seat, some have a step seat. For the ones that have a flat seat, we just got to finish the end off. So yeah. throw them on there, give them about five minutes on the grinder, pull them out, inspect them, measure them, yeah. and um, away we go, ready for the next process. So what we have to do, you, you've got to ensure that it only grinds down to roughly half. Roughly half to three quarters. So some yeah. coils are grinding down to three quarters, some we grind down half. So uh, once they've been on there a while, we're going to pull them off. The other look there, and we just grind him down there to give us that nice flat on the end okay, there. Yep, perfectly flat. Ready to rock and roll, so. From there, we move on to shop cleaning. Shop cleaning. So, Ben, this machine here, you said it's a shop cleaning machine, so what does that mean? What's it do? So, what we're doing, we've got these little bits of shot here, so they're just essentially little ball bearings. So, yep. what we're doing is we're putting them into the shop cleaner, throwing them at a really high velocity, and that's doing two things. It's cleaning off the surface of the material, but more importantly, we're cleaning the surface of the material. So, on that spring, as you compress the spring in and out like this, the, the wire itself is actually torsioning. Yep. So you can imagine, if you tried to twist your finger like that, your skin can move freely on the bone. And it's the same concept. What we're doing is stretching the surface of the steel, so that as
as it rotates, that surface of the seal of the bed is stretched out and peeing, and that increases the fatigue life, and we don't get the cracking uh, associated when you don't have top peening. So it's a really important process. It's not just for cleaning. So once it comes through the other side there, there it increases um, the, the fatigue life of the spring by magnitude. Yeah, so it actually really helps with the integral strength of the entire spring. Exactly. So critical process, cleaning, but more importantly, to increase that fatigue life by stretching the peen. Yeah. So, right, so we're going to get too close here to the shop here there, it's uh, for the balls there, but you can see now the surface on that seal, yeah. wow. nice and clean, nice and shiny, uh, ready for uh, powder coating, scraping and powder coating, but um, more importantly when you look really close, you can see it's like it's been hit with a hammer a million yeah. times. It's been stress relieved. Stress relieved, and that's what yeah. increases that fatigue off of the spring, so once you go through shop here, a nice flat end on that one, look at that, flat end. it's amazing. Sweet. So, from there, from shop beating, we go to the scragging process. So you can see here, we fully bottom out all of our coils, 100% scragging. So this is again probably the most important process in the whole manufacturing process of a coil spring. So what we're doing here is getting rid of the sag out of the spring and again relieving the stresses in it. So through all those processes, as well as stress and, and uh, I guess sag in the spring, so we've got to remove that. So. So you, you, by compressing it all the way, takes, takes the sag out of the spring before it goes to market. Exactly, so you take this spring, it's been rolled right at 550, yep. we want to finish it at 530. Yep. So he's taking it from 550 down to 530. So you can see he does this two or three times. Yeah. You'll measure it. You can do that another million times and it won't move once you get rid of that stress. So okay. That scrags it, gets it to our free height plus or minus 3 mil. And then what it also does, if it finds any defects, if there's a, uh, a small defect in the bar or anything, it's going to break down. So in your car, it's never going to get to bottom out. If you spring bottoming out your car, you've got something wrong with the suspension setup, and we can always be on the bump stops first. So yeah. this process is doing the quality inspections, as well as um, making sure we get everything right, checking for defects, and getting rid so of that stuff. Why did he change machines? This one's got a little bit more power, that one. Then that one, we need to get a down one or two more mil this one wheel to get it within that. So he's just holding tension on that one yep. to make it shrink a little bit. Just a little bit. So what do you call this, scrag or sag? Scrag. Scrag. Okay, with our uh, sleeve hand coils, they're all 100% scrag, so this is how we can guarantee that when our swings go out, we can make sure that we're not going to have any sag because we've gone well beyond the position in the car, right down the bottom out, got rid of all the sag, all the stress, the final process, the same thing again fully computerised, so um, he's opening up his part number, so some land crews at front, 659566s, yep. um, does a final quality inspection, hangs them on the chain. Controlled electronic, we don't use gas or anything here, so yeah, yeah fully yeah, computerized and everything, so it controls the temperature. Um, and you can see, yeah, the powder goes through, so they're, um, yeah, on there. Yeah. Cool. Actually, like, gives it gives a nice even coat, and then they go in through the oven. Tim is going up there, up through the up through the baking oven, you can see the elements going around, fan force, just like an oven at home. Yep. Does a big loop and then comes out, so we'll come back here when they come coming through and have a look. How long will that circuit take? Uh, it's about half an hour. Half an hour? Yep. Wow. 20 minutes, half an hour, they, so. The blokes only physically have to load them onto those. Yep. And then, and then it goes through the whole section. Is, yep. Gets automated, or yep. like the, yep, fully the powder, yep. powder is automated, how it goes on the spring, goes yep. through here, gets baked, comes off. And the only manual handling is to take them off. Yep, and then yeah. on, on the wrappers. Yeah. Right, so we just at the final station now, so we're just doing our labelling and wrapping, so 
Uh, this is where we throw the part number on and the badge number for our traceability right back through the hull system. Yep. Uh, and they go into the rabbit machine, so. And then you know where these are going to get posted to and everything. We know exactly where they're going to go, so all the details come out on the labels he's got there. Uh, all computerised, shows in the customer, everything where they're going, so. So it does one spring individually and then the second then, spring will come in. That's right, so. They go right. into the powder coating machine, they end up here, yep. and then what happens now? So essentially through our whole process, that's where we're uh, fully paperless. Um, we use electronic tracking for all our coil, so because with the shop cleaning process and the heat treatment, there's no way we can physically mark the coil with enough detail other than a few center punch marks to give us some batch numbers and identification. Yep. So it's a matter of electronically tracking each batch as it arrives at each station via the computer doing a full quality inspection of each station and then it comes right through the process. So you can yep. see the cores behind me here. Yep. They come off the chain, we've labelled them up, electronically track them on the chain, off the chain so we know exactly what they are. Yep. And now we're just going to label them up and right. you can see, you can see here, so we've got the part number on here, left side and right side, and then we've got the batch number on there so you can see the batch underneath. Yep. And that batch is what we use to take back for our quality assurance right back through who done every process on what date, when, raw materials, yep. right down to the, the batch number of the, the silicon and the manganese that's gone into our steel. So yep. um, from here then, identify with the customer that we need, uh, and then onto a pallet over to the warehouse yep. and out they go. Please get another sticker on here. Right, oh, so we just signed on our labels for these soils here. Yep. So we got there, and then we got the, the cluster that we're going to over here. Yep. Um, part number for identification. And that's it. Why they go over onto the pallet? They could be done. Wow. So how about this, Ben? This is what blows me away. We're in Australia, obviously. We're in Rockhampton, Queensland. And they'll come along. I found this pallet. How about this? Dobinson, Latin America. So, humble beginnings, Queensland, Australia exporting awesome springs all over the world, mate. That's it, mate. So, I'll tell you what, makes me proud to be Australian. It is, mate, and it's same with you guys. You know, a couple of local manufacturers. Um, we're probably part of a, a dying breed in Australia now, doing, yeah. doing stuff here. So, um, it's fantastic, and, and we're really getting the global recognition now. So, these ones here are off to our store in Panama, and then they'll be distributed all over Latin America, down into Brazil, uh, Peru, Chile, um, all those countries around there. Yeah. So, it just goes to show, how Australians care about quality and you know obviously exporting all over the world the rest of the world wants Australian quality and you know longevity of a great product exactly and, and it's not just the um, it's not just the product itself too it's, it's for us it's three generations and you know more than 70 years of knowledge that, that we can draw on so yeah. you know we haven't been doing this for two years it's 70 years of sprout spring making so yeah. Over those years, you really understand all the little issues that you can have and you can iron them out over the years. And you might have a new, new guy come on the scene and, and he doesn't know these things yet. So, um, and again, that for us and with the, you know, the supply safety of us manufacturing in Australia here, um, we can keep pumping them out. Although we've been flat out and running 24 hours a day for basically six or eight months now to try and keep up with production. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's really uh, filled you with a lot of pride to be able to manufacture something here in a regional town too in Australia yeah. uh, and get it out all over the world. That's credit to you. Thanks, <laughs>
on the end of your shaft is your, your working piston. So um, T66061 CNC machine piston, and um, you can see a bunch of holes in there. So we've got our uh, compression ports and our rebound ports, and then we put the shims over those ports to meter the oil going through that piston. So what that's doing is creating a damping force um, which translates essentially into the, the control into the vehicles. So. Okay, but how, what is the, you know, I suppose, what does the shock do when I want it to stop wallowing? Like I've got a bit of weight in the back of that 200 and I'm cruising along and I've yep. hit some corrugations, hit a few potholes or whatever else, and then the car sort of floats. Yep. What, what changes that? All right, so what we want to do, if you've got that happening, is generally what we call your low speed shaft movement. So um, as you're, you're rolling around, it's, it's not the speed of the vehicle, but the speed of, of the shaft and how fast your suspension's moving. So yep. you, your pistons inside might be going up to, you know, five or 10 inches a second, sort of like this. So it's going up and down as you're wallowing. So what we want to do is control that low speed movement. So generally what we'll do in those cases is throw a little bit more rebound valving in it. That'll stop that spring sort of unloading uh, and wallowing around. Yep. And then we'll also throw, if I can have the reservoir off you there, yep. we'll just throw a little bit more low speed compression into it as well. So compression adjusters are both up on the, on the res here. Uh, and throwing a bit of that low speed adjustment is when that shaft's moving slower, that will yep. add more damping force to restrict those movements. Um, so that restricts the oil flow? Correct. Okay, yep. And, and that's how we get that low speed control. Um, we then can move on to the, the high speed compression adjuster, which is up here on your res as well. Uh, and essentially what that does is gives you the, the high uh, shaft speed movement. So, so does that let the oil pass freer? Uh, not really, it's more the case that when you're hitting a, a big square edge, um, you jump it or you, you know, you're hitting a G out or, or, or whatever, when the, the shock's moving really fast, I mean this can go up to two or three metres a second at yep. shaft wow. speed. So um, you want to control those speeds. So if you're bottling out you know, on these big hits, we can bring in a little more high speed compression damping so that we've got more force at those high speed shaft movements okay. and uh, stop those bottom outs. So, okay. What we might do is have a little bit of a look sort of at the components inside and give you a bit more of an idea. So, oh, fantastic. So we'll start off just with how the, the rebound uh, adjuster works. So we've got our uh, piston for these ones. Um, and, and in the shaft here, we've got a, a flow port that's check valved that allows us to bypass this working piston uh, yeah. on the rebound stroke only. So inside, we've got a little uh, check valve assembly as such. Okay, and where that, does that go? That sits yeah. up in the end of the rod here and that yeah. allows that the, the check valve to only go in one direction so that we can get only rebound control on that. So, yeah. uh, on the other end then, we have our adjuster assembly. So essentially, the rod is hollow. So we've got a, a needle type sort of shaft like this and then we've got a needle and jet style assembly on here. So as you adjust this in through the adjuster, we're closing off that rebound port and stopping that, that free flow around the, on the rebound uh, stroke. So yep. the other end of the shaft there, we have our rebound adjuster, which is a pretty simple sort of setup. The more you screw it in, just the tapered sort of needle there, that gives yep. us the adjustments. So, Okay, um, obviously that's the piston. That's the piston. Yep. And then what's, what's this piece? That's your high and low speed again. So this is the uh, compression adjuster up on yep. the canister. So essentially what we're doing with this is metering the flow of oil that comes into the, the reservoir. So uh, as your shaft enters the shock, the volume of that shaft, that oil has to enter into your reservoir. So in yeah. your reservoir, you've got a floating piston and it literally is just, it floats in there. So it might be about sort of halfway roughly there. We've oil on this side and we've got nitrogen gas on this side. So what we're doing is as that shaft enters, yeah. oil is displaced from the shock body into the reservoir and your floating piston's moving back like that and it's sort of just going backwards and forwards as your shaft's going okay, in and, this, and out of it. And this becomes a cushion chamber. And this essentially chamber, becomes yeah. a cushion chamber and what that's doing is keeping the oil pressurized to stop it from cavitating. So yep. we want to, that's the name of the game essentially with the, the shocks, especially once they start to warm up. So as that oil's passing into your reservoir and through your hose there, we've then got another shim stack. So we run a full shim stack style, um, another, essentially another piston uh, in the, head of the uh, reservoir there. And then we can use our adjusters to monitor the, to uh, restrict the low speed. Yep. Um, so that's as the shaft's going there slowly, we've got a nice bleed path here. We can needle and uh, jet that as well and, and close that off or open it up. Okay, so with the shims though, what does that do? Does it push, this, does it push them apart and let the oil flow past them That's easier? right, that's yep. right. So we've got uh, a couple of shims here on our high speed uh, flow path. And essentially what we can do with this high speed compression adjuster 
is preload that shim stack, so that essentially strengthens that shim stack. So okay. on the low speed movements, we can monitor our meter the oil coming through the, the, the bleed path here. Yep. And then on the high shaft speed movements, because it's more oil than the low speed path can handle, it starts to blow through your shim stack so we can control that that way. So That's absolutely fantastic. Oh. Now I'm oh. starting to get some sort of understanding of how it actually works with where the oil flows and how it helps you with the rebound, helps you with the compression. You know, and now you explain about the high and low speed. It makes sense. Going across those corrugations, yep. you definitely need that high speed adjuster. That's so right. yeah, it gives you just, you know, especially when you're driving to Cape York, you're driving along those corrugations, you don't get all that horrible feel back through the steering wheel. That's and you right. You don't want to float around and, over the place. And you get the big the big G outs on the way to the Cape too. Everyone yeah. knows the, the, the dips on the way up there are pretty famous. You, you gotta yeah. slow down for them. So you wanna be bringing that high speed adjuster up so when you're hitting them, you're not blowing through your travel and, yeah. and banging into your bum stops. Yeah get back onto the highway or whatever, and you might want to loosen them or, or do whatever you need to do to, um, you know, get it a little more plush or, or whatever you need to do, so. Yep. So, these are all your shims here, are they? Yep, so you can sort of see, we've got our, our shim stack light up here in. Um, so what's that one for? That's so that one's on the compression side. Compression, so yep. this is, this here, the shim stack in the actual working piston in the main shock body, we've got uh, two stacks in there. We've got our compression stack and our rebound stack, so. Yep. Essentially, the shims will stack up in the arrangement like this. And it's like a pyramiding stack where they sort of get smaller as they go down. And the thickness and the diameter of these shims that you assemble on that stack will change the stiffness of this stack at different high and low speeds. And that'll give you a different sort of uh, ride control, different sorts of damping forces. And the oil is in through your, your other side of your piston there. And then it's forcing the, the shims up like that to allow the oil out. So you can imagine thicker shims is going to be stronger. So that's going to give you a stiffer damping force. And that's going to give you um, a stiffer, stiffer ride essentially on compression. And then okay. on the other side of the, the coin there, we've got the, the rebound stack. And it's essentially the same thing, but it's in... Works in, the, in reverse. Works in reverse. So the check valve essentially in, in both directions. So one stack yep. does only compression, the rebound stack does only rebound. And then changing those arrangements is is the black art of shock tuning and getting that exactly how you want it. So, so let's touch base on the remote res part again. So obviously that gives you more oil capacity and I, my understanding of a remote res is actually, what it does is it keeps the oil cooler. Is that correct? There's a couple of things. The, the, the best thing about the remote res really is the additional travel you get. So this floating piston, if you have an IFP or our IMS shocks, yeah. that's normally in the working body up in here. So you can imagine you've got this much extra uh, yeah stuff inside your shock here, and then you need your gas chamber as okay, well. So you don't inside. get as much travel. You don't get as much travel because you've only got limited amount of area to work. So okay. you take that out and you throw it into your reservoir and then you pick out a, a ton of travel. Uh, and then the next thing as well, it allows us then to get more oil in the shock, a bit more surface area for cooling as well. So okay. there's some added benefits, but that travel really, travel is everything. Yep. You can pick up travel. Um, that's you know that's sort of better than anything else you get. Oh, that's so. amazing. All right, so uh, we're just going to run. We've just got nine mesh shock. We're just going to run it up on the dyno. So dyno, pretty handy tool in tuning a shock. Uh, essentially, what it does, it's going to run through your different velocities, your, your shaft speed. So we go through the slow speed first, and then it'll build up to your to your high speed stuff. So um, dyno is good sort of to get you in the ballpark, but it's, it sort of only gives you half the picture, much like an engine dyno. You want to yeah. get out there, drive it, feel it that'll give you the, um, the the rest of the picture. So, so this shock here, whereabouts is it adjustable or it isn't adjustable? This is not a non-adjustable, this is just an IMS shock. Um, so I'm just gonna run him up and then after that, I'll bring up some graphs and show some adjustable shocks and show you what they okay. adjustments do and what they look like. Yep. So, so essentially what we're looking at now, we're just going sort of sweeping through the slow speed shaft movements. So um, we do different styles of tests. This is force velocity test. It's not everything, but it kind of is a good, Good display, and it's the easiest way to understand what's happening with the shock. Yep. So, essentially, just comp uh, compressing and, and pulling on the shock, a little load cell up in here, and that's going to tell us the damping forces. So, we're doing 10 inches a second now, um, sort of still in the low, low uh, shaft speed movements, what we call low speed. Yep. Up to sort of, yeah, 15, 16 now. So, sort of starting to move into your mid speeds, and then we'll move into your high speeds. So, that's a pretty rough road. There is, mate. There's corrugations and like on, on some whoops and stuff, you'll see two and three metres a second in. Wow. So you're talking big speed. So 
So you see probably now there's, if you throw your hand on there, there's a little bit of heat coming into that shock now. Geez, well, that is fairly warm. Yep, isn't it? yep. So the, the monotube, the other, the beauty of it is, is when you're working in your outer tube there, you can, the heat transfers directly to that, to yep. that outer tube. Uh, so the cooling can, can occur much quicker. So, but yeah, so essentially it just gives us a, a pretty basic uh, force velocity graph there. So you can see compression above zero, rebound below zero. So if you look here with the shock moving at four inches a second, we're creating 117 pounds of force. So okay. if you want to, if you put 117 pounds or you know 50 kilos, whatever that is on that shock, it will move four inches in one second. So okay, and but that's already pre-shimmed. It's already pre that's right. It's that's pre-valved. That's right. Yeah. So changing the shim arrangement on those uh, compression and rebound shims in the main body that will give you that that difference on here. You will have you might shim it up a bit firmer for a heavier vehicle, and you might then get that figure at four inches a second might be 150 or something. So that'll yeah. give you more restriction to control your low speed um, shaft movement. So uh, from there, I'll pull up some adjustable charts and, and give you a bit of an idea of what's happening with those. Right, so it's gonna give the high speed a bit of a uh, crank up here and uh, run a few passes again with the high speed adjustment moved and uh, see how that turns out. All right, so we just had a bit of a play around with the adjusters on our, our MRA shock there, and you can sort of see we're just doing a bit of a sweep with the, the high speed adjuster. So you can sort of see down in your low speed, five, 10 inches a second, there's not a lot of change, but then you can see the change as you get up into the, the higher speeds there, the up here, 35 inches a second, getting up to a meter a second, you start to get your change there. So um, it's a bit of a sweep on the high speed, and then we'll have a quick look at the, the low speed. Right, so we're just gonna give the uh, low speed a few clicks here. And then we're going to give him a run on the graph and see how he looks. Right, so we just had a quick sweep of the uh, low speed adjusters. So I haven't put everyone on there. There's too many lines on there, but you can sort of just see it. The low speed areas down here, sort of mainly in this five to ten inches a second, um, is where we're getting that, that increase in damping there. So you can see, for example, here you're going some sort of 100 pounds right up to 150, or as, as low as sort of 75 there. So heaps of low speed adjustment and just a few clicks on those and you'll really feel the ride firm up and um, feel that wallow sort of start to, to go away. So we're making the rebound adjustments, we just got a sample rod here, but um, just up on the rod end here for the shocky types and on the strut types, we've got the little uh, knurl nut on top of the, the shock strut. So we can just give that a few clicks and then run the dyno again and see how he comes out. Just looking at the uh, rebound sweep now, the rebound adjuster. So um, again, I've sort of omitted a few clicks there, but you can see the, the difference in the rebound adjuster. So across the whole uh, speed range is where we get the adjustment for the rebound. So again, a couple of clicks on that one, and um, you really sort of feel the difference with the wallow and also um, keeping traction as well. So keep that rebound loose enough to keep the wheels on the ground, but keep the vehicle controlled also. Well, how about that? We've gone and seen the whole place, gone from the steel being chopped to length, to being put in the furnace, to being rolled, to being ground, to being shot peened, to even being powder coated. What a magnificent process and to see it firsthand is such an eye opener. And then on top of that, we went straight down into the shock area and saw how all the shocks were assembled, how they work, how rebound and compression really makes a massive difference to the handling of your vehicle and keeping everything stable on the ground. So look, these guys at Dobinson's are absolute legends. What an insight to the shock and spring industry. I tell you, I'm not gonna forget this one in a while.